Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Sanya Faruqi show. Today, we have somebody joining in from Cairo. She's also known as one of the most outspoken feminist voices in Egypt, Moizan Hassan. Moizan is an Egyptian feminist activist and founder of Nazra for Feminist Studies. She has received many awards, among them the Global Fund for Women's inaugural Charlotte Bunch Human Rights Award in 2013. Hassan and Nazra were jointly awarded one of the Rights Livelihood Awards, often called the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize in 2016 for asserting the equality and rights of women in circumstances where they are subject to ongoing violence, abuse, and discrimination. Hassan has also received the Grant Dink Award for Peace, Rights, and Equality. In her work through Nazra, Hassan has been involved in a range of different activities and campaigns to address gender-based inequalities and forms of injustices while also strengthening feminist mobilization and women's participation in politics. Nazra has played a particularly important role in documenting human rights abuses and sexual violence during and after the revolution of 2011 and has been supporting and advocating for the survivors of sexual assault. Moizan, thank you so much. It is wonderful to have you on the Sanya Faruqi show today. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Moisin, so I'm going to start with, um, you know, your journey with NASDA for Feminist Studies has been going on for more than a decade now. Could you talk a little about uh, what led you to start a feminist initiative like this in Egypt and what is the kind of work that you have, you've been doing through NASDA? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, in the beginning, really, it's my pleasure to be with you and having this discussion with our uh, our South feminists, generally, I do think that it's always important to see our movement as collective one. So I'm really happy and glad and thrilled to be with you. Thank you so much. I do think that there is something personal and political. And as a feminist, I have been seeing it is so interconnected being a feminist in private and the public thing. We are coming from this country and this region, which has really an outstanding and long history of being a feminist in this country. And it's not it's not some, something new or it's not something westernized or not coming and not authentic and other things. And honestly, I do think that it is part of the real need and eagerness of the Egyptian women to live and enjoy their own rights. And I think I'm one of those women who have been live, lived in this country and seeing this gender dynamics and patriarchy all over the places. And I was yani, lucky enough to have my, my mother to to educate me how to be a strong woman, even if it's not the feminist as, as it is. And also be lucky to see and read the journeys of other feminists. So I think that it's my place. I want to continue doing this. And I'm really happy with all the pressure. I'm glad. So uh, what kind of work has Nazra been doing over the years? What, what is, uh, is it an institute? Is it an NGO? What have you been doing? Nazra, we are always happy to say that we are a group because how we are structured, it is something as a tool, not as uh, the aim itself. The aim is that we are seeing ourselves as a group part of the movement in this country and this region. And we are... We are really believing in uh, in differences, intergenerational. Uh, a big movement has its different uh, opinions uh, and uh, and tools, but at the same time, we are in solidarity and connected in in the minimum and understanding what we need uh, in this uh, country. We have been working before the revolution. And mainly we were, and people are talking about us that we were a new wave in this country. Maybe we are coming, we came in a time that most of the feminist movement has been co-opted, has been co-opted either by the state or other political groups who didn't see us as an independent feminist movement. And 
the we were part of this process before the revolution and we were mainly focusing on having violence, sexuality as the and new perspectives in Egypt at this time. And then the revolution came 10 years, it's something so complicated to understand it. And we thought that we aim to engage people, but now people are engaged how to continue building with them this feminist movement and at the same time how to work on a discourse and narrative in a revolutionary time, which is a hard task. <laughs> Uh, we have been working on the issue of women human rights defenders, working on the issue of women in politics, mentoring women to engage in public uh, positions, uh, policies, uh, uh, and also right in the process of constitution, because we wrote two constitutions in 10 years. Uh, in addition to the poor issue, which is so hard, painful, but I think this is something the essence of Nazra is working on the issue of sexual violence and rape, uh, mainly from 2011 until now. We, we are working from a masculinity and sexuality approach. We have been engaging in different young generations and new groups in different places, not only in Cairo and our country, and also in the region to continue having this different generations of the movement. Yeah. Um, during the Egyptian revolution in 2011, we saw women protesting on the streets like never before. You were also very active at that time, and it's been 10 years since then. What are the major changes that has taken place in Egypt as of now? I think it's also important to see what happened in the last in 10 years ago that it's not the beginning. I think one of the patriarchal approaches all the time in understanding our situation that every incident is the first incident. So people have been so impressed by having Egyptian women and men, by the way, but I, as a feminist, I was reminding and I was shocked and because I was active before the revolution. So understanding what's happening in 2011 was something so overwhelming and honestly still overwhelming for me. But at the same time, I am reminding myself all the time as an Egyptian feminist that I am coming from this movement which came out and speak of from 1919 about women's rights and about in the public sphere. I'm reminding myself that I am coming from this long-standing movement which also in 1954 when Doria Shafi has been protesting with more than a thousand women she was leading this protest on, to the Egyptian parliament in order to asking for rights for women and demanding as to demanding rights for women in the Egyptian constitution that what happened in 2011 is only another stage. It's not that I or my colleagues created it. We did it in the time and space of 2011. And because of that, I can analyze what was happening until now that it's not right or wrong. Societies are not static. So we have been in different pain and loss and grief and many of hard incidents that we saw. We saw systematic and more sexual assaults happening in front of us and we felt so incapable. We are seeing our friends whom some of them, their faces are there spending the 10th anniversary of the revolution in jail in the time of COVID-19. We have been seeing those survivors, people are pressuring them. But at the same time, we have been seeing these women and movements struggling to have new rights has never happened before in the Egyptian constitution. We have been struggling a lot on the issue of sexual violence until we put it on the agenda that no one in Egypt now is saying that it is in our heads. No, it is a reality. It has a national strategy. It has every time we are having, we have been pressuring and not only the state, but also all the political groups who have been for years trying to make us crazy that it is in our uh, uh, heads that there are different generations, people we don't know. It became so mainstream 
sa yes it's her and and nothing could happen without having a real public sphere because none of the social movement can exist by itself if really they want to be not co-opted by a state, especially a securitized state, which sometimes saying that, yes, it's your time and other time. No, 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 it's not your time. And most of the securitized regimes are so conservative, so they can demand you staying, saying yes to them as men and masculinity perspective, and honestly fragile masculinity perspective, but they, they couldn't be with you while you are saying that your body has rights. Um, it's so complicated and it's hard. So, and maybe I'm biased, maybe I'm so drained and that real analyzing is hard. But at the same time, I think that unpopular opinion, Yani, we are a successful movement, not a failed movement. <laughs> Of course, um, moving to you know what 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 the impact of the work that you have done, United Nations and many other international organizations have condemned the systemic uh, persecution of NGOs in Egypt. Your organization, Nazra for Feminist Studies, has faced similar charges for receiving funding from foreign sources, and your accounts have been frozen. And you yourself have uh, a travel ban imposed on you, and it's been almost five years now. Tell us a little about the current scenario with Nazra and the charges, and how difficult it is to continue doing the work that you are doing. Yeah, I think this is one of the prices we are paying, and personally I'm paying, decided not to be under the umbrella of any group. And it's hard, I'm not saying that uh, I'm happy, no, it's hard. And for years it's so draining and it's so... It's so unfair. It's really so unfair. But at the same time, I do think that what's happening to Nazra is a clear example of how securitized people and patriarchal conservative people couldn't accept feminism and feminist acts. Yes, I have been part of a big case which has many of other human rights defenders and women human rights defenders. But I'm the only one who has a charge against me that I'm supporting women to have Ill irresponsible liberty. So <laughs> that I have something Could special. Can you explain what that means? What, what, what... Yani, I, I don't know, Yani, I don't know until now, Yani, but at the same time, it is part of what's happening in Egypt generally that we are uh, charging women that they are uh, destroying the Egyptian family values, or we are uh, claiming that feminists are, uh, are doing bad things. As it's happening in different regions, Yani, we have been seeing feminists all over the places have been uh, named as witches, as prostitutes, as uh, foreign agents, as crazy, as uh, as paranoid. <laughs> we have this all the time, and I think this is part of how how those people are seeing being active and feminist and independent that no it's not the right responsibility and the right liberty because always for women and on gender issues there is right or wrong and right are the basis for men and people in power to decide but I'm seeing this within this thing we are the first organization from the 50s to be in this harsh charges as a feminist organization and even within other organizations in the same case that we are the only organization which has the asset freeze on me as a director, on my assets and also on Nazra as an organization. So as if those people are telling you that, no, you don't exist. We are not accepting this issue. And it's so complicated, it's so complicated for a priest mainly working on a movement that it is not safe for people you are working with. Uh, the smear campaign against us 
made lots of barriers between us and people. And even because, yani, alhamdulillah, yani, we have certain legacy with many people in, in Egypt, but at the same time, it's so risky. Yeah. So risky to work with survivors and giving specialized yani, uh, services and treatment like we have this holistic approach and of surviving while they are survivors and at the same time you are targeted. So supposedly they don't need another trauma and you couldn't put them in your place. But, and the resources, because many of the people have been yani, accuse us all the time that we are taking foreign funding, we need the resources. And honestly, yes, we need resources. The movement needs resources because we are not those individuals who are coming up in the early morning writing a piece or now writing on social media. No, we are constructive people working um, professionally on policies, services, and other things. So resources are important. And the problem that, not that we are having um, resources, the problem with us and those people, and even as other groups, not only the state and power, that we are using these resources in ways which is not serving them. It's serving uh, women. This is their problem and I, I do think I'm always advocating for this that yes we need resources. This region all the time need a feminist fund, need us to claim our resources. Yeah so but despite all the challenges that you're facing you know you have continued to work and you found various media platforms to continue the work of nazra and reach out to women and uh, you know enable them and be a strong voice uh, could you talk a little about that and also how difficult the alternative way of working has been yeah, this is one of the things we decided, and personally I decided when we have been under this attack that the only way to continue, to continue even have the sanity of understanding why they are doing this for you, is to continue doing whatever you believe that it is right. And honestly, when the time is harder, I do think that we choose the right choice and our hearts were in the right place because because they will attack us anyway but for people who decided to live as feminists not only as war that you found yourself every day thinking about these things so continue serving the movement with a structured way and with all your passion it's making you honestly alive uh, this is one of the things about the decision and also like you were asking in the beginning are we institute or NGO we have been seeing all these things as tools not as yeah, any goals itself so maneuvering things using different platforms thinking and investing in younger generations because yeah not only by targeting but supposedly you shouldn't be do whatever you have been doing in the 10 years, you should go to other places and people have this. So maneuvering and thinking wider than this small corner perpetrators wanted to put women all the time in it is a survival mechanism for us as people and also for the movement and for the cause. Yeah. Um, in the recent but it doesn't mean that I'm happy, Yang. <laughs> it means that I'm so stressed, pressured, facing many traumas. Yang, it doesn't mean that Yang, it's yeah. not coming with its consequences. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we're seeing Egyptian women taking lead positions and talking about sexual violence and harassment very openly. And, you know, while social media is highly criticized these days for spreading hate speech and the trolling, it's also become a very powerful instrument for the women to be vocal. How do you see that? And um, how has that changed over the years, uh, the way women approach uh, being survivors or approach, uh, you know, speaking out or calling out any form of harassment or violence that they are experiencing in the country? 
I think it's important to analyze the social media from the context generally in Egypt that for years we have been in this pressure that there is no limitation in the public sphere. There is a real closure of the public sphere. So I've, almost every group has been organized. They have many people who were arrested, supposedly arrested, or they will be arrested. So people have been using the social media as alternative public sphere. So I think it's important to see it within this perspective, which has the same people. So the state became to target people on social media, on Facebook status. Uh, many women have been facing hate speeches or pressuring or targeting on the social media, like what was happening in the public sphere. So seeing this in this way is something important to understand what's happening, especially in the year of COVID-19, because everyone in the world were on the social media. We had certain time last year that all, almost all people in the world were locked down at the same time. Yeah. So this is our way to communicate. So women have been using it in a smart way. And also it's a generation thing. Yeah. And we were the generation when we discovered the Facebook, we, we thought that, wow, we are the best people ever. But now I have my niece who's 15 years old, always telling me that I'm old school because I'm the generation of the Facebook because they have their tools now. Yes, and she has been, wow, yeah, it's so old. Facebook is so boring, yeah. But there's thing about Instagram and TikTok and others. So it's also generation thing. And this is also by understanding the intergeneration, by understanding how other people are communicating about what they feel. Yeah. What has been the impact of the pandemic, COVID-19, on um, the work that you're doing in the country? Has the sexual violence increased? How, how are women dealing with it? How, like, how have you been working on it? I think it's still hard to see the real impact because it's still ongoing. And with the less transparency we are living in, so until now we don't know the reality and the impact. But in violence against women, I do think that it was so clear. It was so clear in the public and the private, uh, in the social media, by state actors, by nine state actors, by relatives, by husbands, by fathers. So it is something, and I think uh, this... Uh, wave of speaking up about social about sexual violence it was the time for egypt like many things because it is a building movement it's not coming one day it has been related to international but at the same time this is a struggle we have been in clearly about the issue issue of sexual violence from 2005 so i do think that the impact is still it's hard but at the same time uh, uh, the gender discrimination was so clear yeah. that women are impacted more than men from this COVID. How all the rights we have been given as women before is taken out of us that those women who are mothers, as example, they have to do everything once and they have, and the other part where they are not going to work, most of them think that uh, it's not their job to do something inside. Being locked down mentally, physically, and financially is so hard. So I think we will see the impact after that. We tried, we tried to work and see this. We could use uh, yani, checklists on how we can deal with this. We did a, a deep work on the uh, well-being and personal uh, psychological uh, uh, helping for women, not only as individuals, but as family and other things. We have been advocating to have our friends at the WHRDs out of jail because it's really risky. 
we have been uh, working and mentoring other groups in different places in Egypt and in the region how to tackle these issues. We try to do different uh, documentation and seeing differences about uh, uh, and similarities about other pandemics, other epidemics yani, happened or other hard situations women have been facing and connected with other families in the world and the region and thinking together how we can do these things with the helping survivors coming out of all these incidents and others which, which not a trend on Facebook or a trend on social media in a way. Uh, we tried, but it's really hard. And uh, one group targeted couldn't do things. It has to be a real political will, political will by the people who are empowered, by other political groups, by the international community that those women really need process of surviving. Yeah. My last question to you, we're running out of time. How easy or difficult it is to be an activist in Egypt? No, it's not easy at all. It's so hard. And I think being an activist is something so hard. Being a feminist, harder. And being uh, a person who's not part of a social gang politically is harder and harder. But I think personally, Yanni, as a person, it's my journey. I don't think that after 10 years of the revolution, I have been being in this public sphere for almost 20 years. No one took my 30s and 20s. I lived it. I worked on it. I failed and I succeeded. Uh, I think yani, it's really hard, but also it's a choice. No one, yani, it's really a choice. Yeah. All right. On that note, thank you so much, Mozan. It was wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for taking your time out. And I wish you all the luck with all the work that you're doing. And please stay safe during the pandemic. And you too. <laughs> thank you for joining the Sanya Faruqi show. And for those of you who've been tuning in, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you will subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'll see you again next week.